Hey, everybody that's out there. This is Monty Cano, Director of Customer Success at Horizon 3 AI. We're going to start here in just a minute. The uh, Chief Technology Officer for the company is going to give his cold opening. So uh, stand by one. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Pilater. Everybody calls me Tony P. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder for Horizon 3 AI. And we are really, really excited to have everybody show up. Uh, the thing that we are about to talk about, the password pandemic, is, is huge, uh, and it's a big deal for us. And, and this is a non-sales type thing. Uh, most of us come from a military background, and giving back and giving, doing service is a big part of us. Uh, so we want to we want to find ways to to give back. And one of those ways that we are giving back is uh, demystifying cybersecurity, offensive cybersecurity, and hacking. Uh, for anybody who wants it and needs it. It's a big deal for us. Uh, it's, there's, there's a lot of mystique and a lot of black fog, black magic fog around it. Uh, and, and we think that's why there are a lot of these kinds of problems that we're seeing, a lot of the things that we're, we're finding. Um, and we wanna show you how we do it, what it is that we're finding and, and how you can see the same things in your environment uh, to make your environment safer. And that's not just at work, that's also at home. A lot of these things apply to things at the house too. Um, so I'm excited to, to see uh, see these. And this is the first of many that we are going to do more on the, the tech side, the we are practitioners side uh, to give back to you. So uh, I'm gonna get out of the way of the team, let them do their thing and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you on, on more of these. So thanks for joining us. Monty, go ahead, brother. You bet. Thank you very much, Tony. So good uh, morning, good afternoon, and happy noon to everybody who's out there. Uh, I am Monty Canote. I'm the Director of Customer Success. You got to hear from uh, Anthony Pilatera, the CTO for the company, and we have two of our uh, red team experts, nation state hackers, whatever you want to call it. They are uh, subject matter experts that are going to uh, give some of their very valuable time and walk you through how some of this happens. So, uh, Without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that everybody can uh, see this in uh, full mode, and uh, we'll go ahead and step through. Uh, one thing I would ask is that as we uh, get going, make sure that you uh, post your questions in, in the uh, questions area there, and we'll get to them, and uh, that'll be the easiest. We're not going to open up the volume for everybody to just go ahead and ask. That way we'll just make it nice and easy. You can post your question there. And then when those come up, we'll make sure that Naveen and Zach have it. So as you got to hear from Tony, this is all about understanding credential attacks. And what you're gonna expect today is we're gonna talk, uh, this is gonna reference a white paper that Horizon 3 published on the password pandemic. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the problem that we're facing and I say we, very specifically because this is something at work, at home, your family, this is something that we're all in this together, which is why down below you can see we allude to, this is a team sport and how we can help each other. Uh, Naveen and Zach are gonna walk through an anatomy of a credential attack, something that they have executed numerous times and they're gonna show you exactly how they did this. And uh, at the very end, we're gonna open it up for our aha moments. And that stands for Ask Hackers Anything. So if you have any questions about security or their approach or how they think about something, this is gonna be your opportunity. And we're gonna take a few moments to go ahead and uh, open up uh, for you to ask some very direct questions of them at the end. So I'm expecting the whole, from front to end, this should take about 45 minutes. If we have any extended questions, we are more than happy to hang out, make sure that we're answering them fully. So without further ado, uh, the premise of this is that attackers don't hack in, they log in. And we see a lot of this in the movies where uh, people act like everything's gotta be a zero day. Even in some of the headlines, you'll hear they used a sophisticated attack. And this was a persistent adversary. And so what we wanted to make very clear was uh, hackers aren't usually trying to burn malware or zero days. Often what they want to do is be able to get a credential. And a credential uh, attack very specifically is a credential uh, when attackers steal your credentials to gain access and bypass an organization's security measures. What that means is they look legit. And it is extraordinarily hard for any of the tools that are out there to be able to discern between legitimate 
an illegitimate activity when somebody is using a credential. So I'm going to premise all this with a little bit of a backstory here, uh, something that resonated with me for a long time while I was in the military and uh, has carried over with family and such. Uh, while we were defending our Air Force networks, uh, we would get assessed. And when somebody would assess us, they would inevitably come in and they would get access. It seemed almost too easily. And we had invested so much time and effort and money in these different tools and capabilities. And they would always, at the end of these assessments, show how they used a credential from somebody that they stole on some other location. And they were use that to be able to get into our major networks. And it was incredibly frustrating because all the millions in malware signatures and sandboxes and endpoint detection response and all these capabilities to include firewalls and everything on the inside and outside that we were doing to make sure that we were at the top of our game were pretty much useless against a credential attack. And here's what I, and I wanna just set the stage for you here. When we look at what these different tools do across a kill chain, when you talk perimeter defense, uh, and you view that hard, crunchy exterior, for a long time, companies uh, have really viewed, if I can stop you from getting in at that firewall, then I'm good to go. And what we've really found over the years is that uh, the perimeter is uh, perimeter defense is just one part of the solution. It is nowhere near enough to keep you protected. And as you can see from the kill chain, it only does a couple things. When you then go into your security monitoring, and the reason why I put the orange flags up here is because when you talk about network security monitoring, things like solar winds that were out there, they create flags and they are looking for a very specific activity. But what you see is they are very point in time efforts and very device centric, almost like when you look at a vulnerability assessment scanner where they have an agent and that agent is on a specific device look at scanning that device for those vulnerabilities, and then it's reporting them back to you to let you know, hey, this is vulnerable. This is the score of that vulnerability. You're gonna to need to fix this. And then your endpoint detection response, it might be looking at some of those devices at well, but it's also looking to see if certain behaviors and activities are taking place that might be nefarious in nature. And what brings it together is when you have these seams and sores so that they're doing the orchestration and automated re automated, automated remediation, uh, some of those capabilities, they will create flags and alerts. And that's what you start to see here is you get this alert fatigue when you're trying and you're trying to make heads or tails of how things connect. But what ends up happening is, is you've just got a whole lot of alerts and it's very hard to move out and start creating results. And then when you get into the breach and attack simulation, Baz is very popular right now. It'll go down a specific path, a specific simulation that you wanted to specifically execute. So if that's what you wanted to do, it'll go ahead and do it. And then when you have a pen test like we did, you see there at the end, that's where they got domain credentials. That's the pen test. They'll go through, but you don't even see most of the time till the very end. And getting them to show you, they just say, I got domain, we pwned you because their goal was very different than our goal. And what you find is what's really happening is something like this. And this is where you're fully getting to see that cyber kill chain is that there were four different ways that were being executed to be able to get to your domain, four different attack paths, but you only saw a spot reference on any of them. And of those where you see that red, that's where a credential was identified. And so when they did the pen test, you might be able to see, okay, there's the red, that's the credential they got there and the credential at the end, but very few capabilities showed how a credential was captured and then reused that could really give you some insight because as we said up front, a credential attack looks legitimate. And it, that is why it's so very hard to stop. So some of the things that we're seeing out in the wild and what's going on here, when we look at some of the trends, let's look at attacker trends first. So when we see brute force or the use of those different brute force activities, uh, the Verizon data report showed that almost 80% of the hacking related data that was compromised was taken through this way. 
when we talk about credential stuffing, the FBI in their report, they show a three-year trend that's been the greatest impact across the financial sector. And credential stuffing, I'm going to let Naveen and Zach tell you a little bit more about that. But in my very simple terms, that's almost like uh, that's when you just shove everything that you can at something and you're seeing what takes. And that to include password reuse. Then when we get into the malware free attacks, this is the one that CrowdStrike published where they also showed a three-year trend. Everybody talks about uh, malware and uh, zero days that don't have, uh, that might even have a CVE or their specific malware developed. The CrowdStrike annual report showed that we are now for the first time malware free attacks have eclipsed attacks that are using malware. And that includes phishing. That includes other things that then do, that do a malware pull load that creates an implant in your networks. So those are some of the, uh, the trends that are going on for attackers. Now, what's industry trends doing and what are we seeing there? Uh, across industry, there was a uh, study by Veronis that showed that almost 61% of companies uh, have over 500 accounts with non-expiring passwords. We just talked with a company this last week where they said, look, we don't want to make things harder on the user. I firmly believe in non-expiring passwords. That's great in the name of ease, but the risk that creates to not just your company, but your other customers because of this policy can create some real problems. And so just understanding that risk is pretty important. To include uh, post-breach inaction, Carnegie Mellon showed that only about a third of people change their passwords after a breach. This is both companies and people who have their LastPass or Google, their browser related, that are now identifying, hey, your password, it looks like might have been compromised. These are things you got to pay attention to because if you do not, you're just giving that attacker that much more time to reuse that password and go forward. And that expanding attack surface. As you all know, across COVID, over at COVID-19 over the last year, and with uh, the Internet of Things, there are a lot more things out there that agents are not being deployed on, that attackers are now able to reuse. We've seen Android debug and other different capabilities that we've been able to utilize, but that attack surface has just blown up and it is not stopping. Whether you look at your Tesla car or that charger or anything, where they are connected to your networks, they are creating vulnerabilities. And so what we're seeing is that attack surface carry over into the personal trends. You have more devices, you have more apps and more accounts to the tune that now most people on average have more than 100 accounts. So every time you log in on Candy Crush and share your Google with them, that's not exactly uh, the best thing to do sometimes, let alone where, and when we, uh, the SolarWinds attack showed how they were using some of those tokens and reuses across other places to pivot and expand even more. And that password reuse, that's one of the last personal trends and why this matters so much for both at home and at company is that people are reusing passwords uh, at that, for their Netflix and their corporate environment. And that uh, we've got all the references in the white paper and at the back of this brief, both will be made available to you. Uh, those are things that people are seeing all across the board. And this is why this matters so much is when you look legit and it, we make it easier for attacker to look legit there when they're going to go after what's easy. They don't want to do what's hard. They want to do what's easy and fast. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Zach and Naveen to go ahead and talk a little bit about easy and fast and some of the TTPs they use and their credential attacks. Hey guys, I'm Zach. I'm one of the uh, red teamers with Horizon 3. And uh, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the um, categories of how a credential attack actually happens. So like Monty was saying, um, these days, attackers aren't trying to uh, risk using their zero days and implants. They're going after the easy things that where if they mess up or you notice, it's not going to cost them anything. So the first thing a lot of times what an attacker will do is just do open source intelligence gathering against your organization. So ways you can gather information about an organization, LinkedIn, people are readily placing their employer information and what they do. Uh, on LinkedIn. So you can gather all the employee names that work at a company. And then there's also sites like Hunter IO where they provide a service where they just provide you email addresses for any organization you're interested in. So right there, you're getting 
thousands of usernames, potential usernames for a company that can be used in an attack. Then also in breaches, with all the breaches in different places these days, you can go in, find email addresses, and then even more valuable, you can find passwords in the, breach, the breaches. And that includes not just their um, work accounts, but their personal. And like Monty was saying, a lot of times people reuse personal and work ones. Um, and then just to confirm that those usernames are real, uh, you can test those usernames on external sources for people hosting different things in the cloud, or if you have access into their domain, there's a lot of ways you can confirm a username is real over different protocols like SMB and Active Directory. Um, and externally, you can test if a username is real by using different um, Office 365 timing attacks or their uh, misconfigured mail servers by trying to send an email. Um, and it'll tell you if that's a real username at that company. Um, and so um, the next step would be uh, password spraying. So you, you've collected a thousand usernames. Now let's see if any of them have weak passwords. So you spray like really simple stuff like the name of the company or like spring 2021, things like that. They're just real basic. And a lot of times you'll come up with a few that actually hit. Um, and a lot of times these days, so there's so many services out there and there's so much rogue IT infrastructure that um, it's hard to manage and actually set up these services correctly. So a lot of times there will be default credentials left open. So you might have admin, admin on a service and those services with the uh, COVID and pushing companies to host a lot of services external, people forget to configure those things. So you're, you're left with external services that people can just log into and abuse. Um, credential reuse, people using the same passwords externally um, for personal stuff like Netflix and then the same stuff inside. Uh, phishing attacks are huge too. Um, there's a lot of um, legitimate looking emails that are making their way past email filters and it just takes one user to be phished and you can grab their credentials and those credentials can be used to access any external um, information or if they get access and actually get a shell inside, they can start using those credentials in the domain. And then uh, credential dumping. So um, there's a lot of different ways to do credential dumping or obtaining credentials. Um, one way would be network sniffing. So you have a presence in their network and you just listen for different types of traffic. Um, and if it's a cloud environment and if you gain access or exploit some service on the cloud, you can get the metadata URLs and with that, those type of tokens, you can start enumerating their cloud assets and seeing what permissions it has. And a lot of times people uh, give a lot more permissions to things than they need. So it, it really uh, makes the blast radius pretty large. And then uh, the last thing is people just leave things out in the open. So uh, their GitHub repos, they might accidentally commit a, a username or a password or their AWS tokens. Uh, and then there's just so much data out there that people aren't aware of. There's just so many defaults that people forget to configure and uh, it can be really dangerous. So next uh, I'll cover a real basic uh, credential walk or credential attack. If you go to the next slide. So one of the most popular uh, tools in penetration testing is a tool called Responder. And what Responder will do is listen on the network and try to man in the middle certain connections. And so it's really common to find that uh, a organization has um, not properly configured their server, servers and Active Directory the right way so that you can actually man in the middle of these requests. But in a lot of cases, you'll be able to capture a regular domain user hash. And because a lot of people use passwords they can remember, they're passwords that you can try to crack. And so we have like word lists that are 113 trillion words long. So there's a good chance that we're gonna find your password in our list. And once we crack it, a lot of times um, we found that the, uh, once you obtain a list of the domain admins in that organization, a lot of times that user will have a domain admin variant. So say uh, in this example, there's a, a user, John, that we got his hash and cracked it. And he has a domain admin variant, admin John. 
and he's reused it. And we see this a lot. So um, the combination of having the uh, weaknesses to responder that allow you to capture a hash, having weak passwords, and then credential reuse allow an attacker, a really unsophisticated attacker to get domain admin within your organization. Uh, right now, I'll hand it over to Naveen and he'll cover a more complex way that attackers are abusing credentials. Hey folks. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk through, so Zach talked through a scenario with an internal pen test um, that's pretty common and very straightforward, not sophisticated at all. I'm gonna talk through another scenario with a company that where we compromised both their external infrastructure and their internal infrastructure, all through credentials. Um, so it's a little bit more extended, but it's also unsophisticated. And you'll see that as I walk through it. So for this particular company, um, we started with looking at the external attack surface and we found a Jenkins server on the public internet. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Jenkins is a web application that a lot of technology companies use for managing building code, deploying artifacts, continuous integration. Um, and from a security perspective, it's really attractive for attackers because Jenkins servers, you know, like net network monitoring solutions and other kind of critical applications, they have lots of credentials embedded within them. You know, for Jenkins to do its job and build code automatically, it needs access to credentials to be able to push that code to different places. So for this customer, we found a Jenkins server on the internet. It was protected by authentication. Um, in fact, it was um, integrated with Active Directory on the back end, um, but it had no MFA enabled on it. So we went to LinkedIn and the company was fairly large. We found about 250 employees that worked at LinkedIn um, for this company. Um, we went to hunter.io and we also gathered email addresses for employees working at this company. Now the email address itself wasn't important. What we were getting from hunter.io was the format of the email. So from the format, we were able to tell, hey, a typical username at this company starts with the first initial and a last name. So we combined that with all the employee names we got off of LinkedIn, and we generated a list of about 250 probable usernames. Then we generated a very short list, about three passwords that we thought were likely to hit on. And this was just based off of the company name. Um, you know, Think about your own company name. Users are going to use passwords that they can remember and are going to get by the default, you know, whatever password policy you've set up. Um, so it's going to be something like, you know, there's a good chance there's some user in your company that's got a password like your company, one, two, three, four, or your company, one exclamation mark. Whatever your password policy is, however long it is, let's say it's eight characters, they're going to pad it out to that amount, make sure they have whatever special characters they need, and, and it'll look fine from a security perspective, like it'll meet your password policy, but it's actually not secure. Obviously attackers know this. So we generated three passwords and we kept the list short because we didn't wanna risk locking out any accounts. And, and then we just did something dumb. We just brute forced it. So we took all the usernames and the short list of passwords and tried all the combinations. Just based on that, we found that we could authenticate 20 employees into this Jenkins server. Now, of those 20, a lot of them could authenticate, but they had no rights inside of Jenkins. They weren't actually you know, developers within the company. But a couple of them were you know, legitimate developers. They had privileges inside of Jenkins. They were not admi admins inside of Jenkins, so they're regular users, um, but they were still users in Jenkins. And if you're a regular user in Jenkins, you, you actually get access to quite a bit of information. So you can see all the builds and build logs, and then you can start, you know, if people don't set up their build jobs in a secure way, often they leak tokens and so forth. So for this particular company, just using regular user access, we were able to get access to their Elastic Container Registry hosted in AWS. Um, and then we could 
pull and push images and so forth. Um, the next step for us was we wanted to escalate from a regular Jenkins user up to a Jenkins admin because Jenkins admin can do a lot more. Um, Jenkins and a lot of web applications have features where you can see all the users in the system. So Jenkins has a feature called people. It's a page you can go to and it'll just give you a list of all users inside of Jenkins. Uh, so we didn't have to guess anymore. So it was, it was at our disposal. We didn't have to go to LinkedIn. We have a full list of users inside of Jenkins. So we took that list um, and we just repeated the password spray again. We had a better list because we knew it was coming from inside of Jenkins. We didn't password spray the same users again that we did before. We kind of took the Delta and we tried again with a new set of users. And this time we hit on another account that happened to be a Jenkins admin. So basically starting with open source intelligence, just you know, doing pretty stupid things, we're able to get Jenkins admins access. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Monty. So what can a Jenkins admin do? It's, it's actually kind of a disaster from a security perspective. So first, you know, we have access to credentials inside of Jenkins, which have to be stored in plain text in some format for Jenkins to do its job. Um, second, Jenkins has a feature called the script console. It's really handy um, for debugging as well as attacking. So what it essentially lets you do is run code on the Jenkins server, and it's whatever code you want to run. So it's equivalent to remote code execution. So any command you want to run on the host running Jenkins, you can run through the script console. Um, one of the most attractive targets for attackers hitting cloud infrastructure. And so this particular case, it was a Jenkins server running on a Kubernetes node hosted in AWS. One of the most attractive targets as Zach described earlier is um, something called these metadata URLs. So all um, or most hosts inside of AWS or um, Google Cloud or Azure, they have these magic URLs that you can hit that are only accessible inside the host. Um, but you're, if you're able to hit them, you can get the credentials that that host is using. Um, and those credentials define the role and privileges and permissions that that host has for the types of things it needs to do. Um, so for AWS, there's a well-known URL you can hit. Um, and through the script console access, we're able to just curl that URL and dump out the access key for that Kubernetes node that was running Jenkins. So that combined with the other credentials that were already in Jenkins, which also included other AWS access keys, we're able to compromise a significant part of their AWS infrastructure. Um, so we enumerated permissions. We had access to their production EC2 instances, S3 buckets, RDS, and so forth. Um, so pretty bad. Um, and again, all of this was done using a legitimate credentials and users. Uh, so we go to the next slide, Monty. So to complete it, so we had access to AWS. Um, we also found from that Kubernetes node, um, because the networks weren't properly segmented, we could access their internal infrastructure. Um, it's very common to have an on-prem network that is connected to your AWS or cloud network. Um, and so we found from Kubernetes node, we were able to hit the Windows domain controllers on the internal network. Um, and so you can kind of guess what happens next. So as Zach mentioned, if you, you know, all these users we had from Jenkins, they were all domain users because it was authenticating using Active Directory. Um, from Active Directory, we were able to dump out all the users in the system. Uh, and because Active Directory will tell you all the privileges and groups of different users, we were able to identify who the domain admins were. Uh, and so to complete it, we did another password spray, starting with the same three original passwords we had in the beginning. Um, and one of them happened to be kind of a throwaway domain admin account that someone forgot and left behind. And, and so then we had domain admin privileges on the entire internal network as well. Uh, go to the next slide, Monty. So I think it's really notable that in everything that 
I described and Zach described. There was not a single CVE that was touched. We didn't have to find a zero day. Uh, there was no vulnerability in the system. Um, and it was really just making use of credentials and guessing. And anyone in this webinar could probably execute the exact same attacks we discussing, Zach and I have discussed, if you just knew what tools were out there and how to get access to that data. Um, so just to enumerate the types of TTPs we just talked about. So we enumerated usernames and passwords using OSINT, um, Active Directory. Um, we did password spray. Um, we talked through credential reuse. Um, we also dumped credentials. Um, so from Jenkins or just sniffing the network um, and from the cloud metadata URLs. Um, so those are all example TTPs that we used in these two attacks. Thank you, Naveen, for walking everybody through that. Uh, last question, Zach, and then this is going to apply to each of you. Zach, on that first real world example, about how long did it take to execute that from start to finish? So the responder attack chain takes, um, depending on how quick you can crack that password, and a lot of times it's pretty fast, I'd say about 10 minutes. Thank you, Zach. Naveen, about how long did it take to go from the front uh, of that attack till you completed with that last step to domain admin? That whole thing is less than two hours. Thank you. All right, so I hope what you're all hearing a little bit of is uh, that this, uh, just like uh, Naveen got the finish off with, this did not use any of these uh, CVEs that are identified. Some software patch was not gonna stop that. This was using the credential attacks that were out there and uh, in a very, uh, uh, not even super novel way. And uh, we've got it all in the brief here. Um, from our operations, and again, as Tony started off, uh, this is the only place where you're going to see the Horizon 3 AI insignia, but I wanted to bring this home to show uh, we do a lot of red team and penetration testing operations. And so this is intended to identify what we have seen as a preponderance over the this last year uh, of uh, most of the attacks that have resonated with people. Of those, we have had a significant number, and our findings are right below the threat landscape there. Uh, Almost six, uh, as you can see, of those top 10 findings are credential related with our number one being weak or default credentials. Uh, we see w default credentials across the board. And this can be anything from Cisco Cisco to Root Tor and all kinds of other capabilities that are put out there. And Tony had a really good article that he published on that on uh, LinkedIn. If any of you get a chance, I'd uh, definitely encourage you to get to uh, read that. Uh, of some of our other findings, one out of eight hosts had de default or weak credentials. So when you just apply that, you know, even if you're on a small uh, enterprise here, such as my home network that has 30 different hosts with Alexa devices, wireless printers, family kids, tablets, phones, and everything there, you're saying one out of eight there. When you get into a corporate environment and you're talking about anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 IP, IPs there, you're in almost a thousand default or weak credentials. Uh, and that's just of the host that a thousand of those hosts are going to be there. So this is not something that uh, is minimal. It's something that we definitely need to take care of. And uh, we feel like we need to do that together. At the bottom, uh, a real quick example impact. Uh, Zach and Naveen got to walk through. And on one of the financial technology companies that we did, uh, when we were going through and we discovered a couple database default credentials, those defaults led to 13 billion sensitive records that were there. And we did, and that uh, op was accomplished in less than two hours. And so uh, this definitely matters. And that's something that one of the reasons why we're hosting this today is we want to help you fix what matters because we're in this together. Many of us work at companies where some of our data might be there and that can be compromised to then come back at us or utilize in other places. And that's why on the right, when we start talking about incident response, uh, if once again, I'm gonna default over to the solar winds here real quick because uh, you might have when something like this happens, you're a little unsure, but then they identify themselves as a victim of a hack. But the truth of the matter is in a supply chain, a hack or a credential attack, you're also a threat now to me at this other end. 
And so existing in that sweet spot in that center is something that can be uh, pretty rough for us. So after describing this diagram, what I did want to do is launch a poll. Everybody, you can see that one out there right now. Uh, we have a poll that's put out there just to identify at the company that you're working in, if you have policies in place to prevent credential attacks, or if you have tools in place to prevent credential attacks. This is completely anonymous. We're not tracking any names, uh, locations, anything like that. But this is to give a get a rough feel for where everybody's at. And then we're going to share these results back with you as well. And I'll go ahead and the polling, uh, we'll cut it off here after a minute. And while that continues and many of you go, uh, I'll go ahead and walk through this uh, bottom line up front. That's what BLUFF stands for, is the bottom line up front. We're in this together. So the first thing we're recommending, you have got to update those default passwords now. I don't doubt your IT ops people uh, know what they are. And if you're at home, and your home router came with a default password, admin, admin, you should update it now. Multi-factor authentication. That was one of the first implementations we did across our company was, hey, make sure that if you are using your company email uh, for LinkedIn, you are using multi-factor authentication. If you're using it for your payroll, use your multi-factor authentication. And you can see this across with Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, many of the different applications give you that option. And we'd highly recommend that you implement that. Now, this is not going to stop everything. Zach and Naveen can talk even more about some lower level protocols that can get around multi-factor authentication. But this is so very important to make sure you're protecting your data and some of the resources that you're accessing is using multi-factor authentication, OK? Uh, next, review your password policy. This is in your company. You really need to understand, is our password policy uh, in place? And is it actually being implemented across the board so that we use multi-factor authentication where we need to? If we have relationship with, with Jenkins, do we understand the risk on us allowing all these passwords and these uh, in the name of speed and convenience and visibility, do we understand where we have given admin rights? Do we understand where we have required passwords to get across network segmentation or to just get access to different records? These are things that you really need to do. And lastly, audit yourself. You need to be pretty darn honest with yourself to know if what I'm using for my LinkedIn is the exact same thing I'm using for my Jenkins, then we just walk through a situation where we're gonna come at it. Uh, and that this is not crazy novel, but you are really putting yourself and some of your other data at risk. And that means not just yourself, but your company and even your family. And that's something that we're all very concerned about. We all have kids. And I know going through uh, Yuga Facebook security used to be a, a very small page. Now it is massive on all the data that they uh, that they and many others, you've seen different uh, things going on with WhatsApp and Signal and other messaging capabilities, auditing yourself and what all you have credentials to and what all you're using. If you're using the same password at this bank, at this bank, at this bank, and then over here for your, uh, cable, tele your cable service, you might have a problem. And so can it create a little bit of pain up front? But there are a lot of capabilities that remember your passwords for you. And we highly recommend that as well. Uh, your logon, if it's always your email, you're making it that much easier for a hacker to be able to get at you when your logon is always that. One of the things we did was we used some random logon names with the op IDs and such. And so that's another thing you might want to consider is when you get the option to create your own logon is making it something different as well, because you'll be that much harder to pass down. And now I'm and then I'm going to say also when we ask the question, this is something else uh, to ask uh, your peers in your security ops center or even your CIO and CISO. Are we vulnerable to credential attacks compromising the business and brand? That's a question that people tend to clench up with when we start asking. And then you got to verify that answer because if somebody says, nope, what's your evidence to support that? And if they say yes, what's your evidence to support it? Both of those are valuable. Both of those are going to help you and your security side be a little bit stronger, okay? So 
The poll that was in progress here, I'm gonna make sure to let you know. The first question, we have a couple policies in place to prevent credential attacks. Of the 14 people that responded, 71% uh, said yes. And four said not sure, only one said no. So of the 10 to prevent credential attacks, uh, I'm sure that you have some kind of password policy, whether it's multi-factor authentication or something that's in place. And then the second question, we have tools in place to prevent credential attacks. 64% uh, said yes. And again, we had a four that said, I'm not sure. So in that recommendation, being able to ask those honest questions and go after and verify those answers, that's gonna be pretty darn important. And we highly encourage you to be able to uh, get after that and understand exactly what is in your company and even at your home when you're doing so. Uh, I'm going to open it up now uh, for Tony to be able, did you have any other recommendations, Tony, that you wanted to uh, make before we open it up to the aha moments? Yeah, there was a couple quick things that I wanted to add to the, uh, to those points in there about uh, passwords. Review your password policy. There's a couple points there. Uh, you have a password policy, and that is something that's written down in you know, in PDF form that your users sign that's saying that they will do this. There is also the technical implementation of that, which usually comes in the form of some group policy or some, something of that nature. Um, but there are other things that you can do to help uh, mitigate and do more validation of that. Uh, you could also be going out and doing, your, doing OSINT on yourself uh, going out and getting breach data and checking to see if any of your passwords uh, do that. We used to dump our, uh, on the inside, we used to dump all of our password hashes and run them on a regular basis through uh, easy password cracks to see if, uh, see if those things were there. Um, and we would do that on ourselves on a regular basis. Anybody who, who failed that or any password that got cracked, they automatically got, you know, reset and the user had to reset it. So uh, there's some pieces there. Um, MFA, I think we kind of already talked about that. MFA is good. I, I'm looking at the questions that are popping up uh, and we appreciate those. Uh, and the specific one that I was looking at uh, was was Paul Baldwin's question. And he says, he says, passwords suck. And yes, you are absolutely right. Passwords suck. And But yes, I agree. I don't foresee them going away anytime soon, at least not holistically. Um, and not enough platforms offer MFA. Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, I think that's a matter of us demanding it more. Um, the hard part is some of the services that we want to use, they don't do MFA um, or they do MFA through SMS, which I don't particularly like. Um, we either use them and they perpetuate it or we don't use them and we don't get the service that we need. We got to go find it somewhere else. So it's all in like through demand and through the use of that platform, it continues that kind of mindset. So if you have the ability, don't use that service. Um, th that's one, one way there. Uh, I I'll answer this question now instead of going to the aha moments for Paul. Um, I don't mind, key pass, I don't mind. One password, I don't mind. Um, I think there, there's a few of them. There was a couple of vulnerabilities or issues that came out with them uh, a, a while back about how they um, store your passwords or how they store your credentials. And some of them leave it open in memory. Um, those vulnerabilities and issues are there, um, but the, uh, not using one, I think, is more of a risk. Um, I don't know any of my passwords. It's all randomly generated. If somebody tried to you know, hold a gun to my head and tell me to log into my bank, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so, so yeah. Use case, I use one password. Not thrilled about it, but I use it. My family has 130 plus passwords, and I don't know any of them. That's good. That's good. You, you, are, you are protecting yourself there. One other thing there, and I, I tell this to my family as well, um, OSINT also gives a lot of answers to the security questions. Now, this isn't so much on the technical side. This, is, this one is thing for my family and, and for families and for, and for users, but it, I think it's important. Um, um, 
the, the security questions are like, what was your first high school or what was your high school mascot? That stuff's all open. You can find a lot of those pieces in open source. Um, so my, my security question answers are also random. And I don't know any of those. Those are all part of my password manager. Um, and I have my parents do the exact same thing. Now that means for my parents, I have had to reset their passwords many, many, many times because they don't update them in their password manager. And that's kind of been a pain in the butt, but uh, even those types of things uh, should also be random. You shouldn't be able to answer any of those questions with just looking something up on the internet. So uh, yeah, that's good, that's good. Uh, so yeah, uh, sorry, go ahead, Monty. No, go ahead. Uh, we've got more questions coming in. So I wanted to be able to, uh, if I asked uh, uh, Naveen, what are some of the things to keep in mind while designing a secure IoT? So as IoT, we we're now seeing Raspberry Pis and all kinds of other different capabilities using mobile platform as well as other small software sets. What do you think are some, uh, some first recommendations you might have for some of the people that are dialed in on this conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same thing as it would be for any kind of traditional web application. So default credentials is a big one. Um, there's a lack of maturity in terms of, you know, exposing ports, debug ports and stuff. And, and Zach, I, I think you can probably talk through those scenarios that you've seen in the real world. Um, so really is how is authentication being accomplished to the device? What kind of ports are open? How is it being exposed, network segmented? Um, is it on the internet, so forth? So those are all kind of common design questions and it's not really specific to IoT, um, but just general best security practices. And I think there has to be a shift where the same stuff that we're learning about web applications and everything else we've been develop developing, that has to make its way down to the IoT world as well. Did you want to add anything to that one, Zach? Yeah, I think the, the one thing I would recommend um, is I've seen a lot lately where a lot of IOT devices, if there is any type of authentication is they just fail to um, hash the password that's stored. The, all the passwords are just typically and credentials are stored in clear text. So making sure that you uh, store any type of credentials in a hashed manner um, and at that a secure hash that isn't quickly brute forcible. Um, and that will bring you levels above a lot of other IOT things. Yeah, the other thing to add in that I think it's kind of a must have at this point is a secure update mechanism. Um, we hear about all sorts of IOT devices that they're vulnerable, but much worse than web applications and stuff. Once they're vulnerable, it's very hard to get them updated. Think about the last time you updated the firmware on your router. Like I did this, you know, relatively recently, but how many people are actually checking to see if their router has been recently vulnerable, what CVE is out there against it, um, and then gone and gotten the firmware and updated again. So these devices are just lying around um, if you're not paying attention to them. You better have said recently, Naveen. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> you, you better have said you updated it recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Tony, I'm gonna to come back to you because Greg Moore asked the question, you were just talking a little bit about uh, password tools and storing them. What if that password tool is hacked? Isn't that a risk? And wouldn't it be worse than one password being compromised? Yeah, there, there, there's, there is definitely risk there. Um, I think those tools do a good job of the, on the encryption side. Uh, so it's more a matter of, um, of making sure that the password that you use to get into it is secure. Um, there, are, there are, if you look up um, one password, key pass vulnerability, where it's storing some of those things in clear text and memory. Uh, so what, the way that I mitigate that is I, I don't use it on a regular basis, meaning I don't have it open all the time. So I open it, I use it, I close it, and I completely exit out of it. Um, that, that mitigates some of that risk. Um, yeah, Naveen, Zach, what do you guys think? Would you rather have users, you know, have passwords sprayed all, you know, all over the place or is one password and password managers good? 
I think definitely the risk of not using a password manager, both personally and for a enterprise password manager is um, if you don't use one, your risk is much higher because if you just reuse your password everywhere, then all it takes is one service being compromised and you get access to everything. But it's it's much more difficult to compromise one, the workstation where your password manager is being stored and then find an additional vulnerability to retrieve the credentials out of the password manager. So it's, I think there's a lot more risk not using a password manager. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. We've got a good question from David Samara, and he's a senior IT manager making a shift from IT ops to cyber. And he's asking like a, about a baseline certification or education that would provide some basic hands-on experience in cyber forensics, pen testing, et cetera. And he's asking about some of his options. So I'm gonna uh, get, I think each of us, we have some different certifications in education and people are gonna identify uh, some holy grail ones that are out there. Uh, I think it really, I'll uh, offer mine up. I think it really matters on what you want to do. If you want to be hands-on keyboard, or if you want to be doing some other kind of an analysis, or if you want to be doing a higher level management, if you're a senior IT manager, then of course, uh, the CISSP and some of those kinds of certifications are going to be very valuable. Some of the uh, more management SANS ones that are focused on risk are going to be there. And then at the other end, and I'll let uh, uh, Naveen, Zach, and Tony talk a little bit about it, some of the holy grail ones like the OSCP, which is uh, uh, very, that is really a legit credential. And I think that's uh, what you're kind of asking. What are those legit, legit credentials and trainings that you want to have in your background? Go ahead, guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll add mine real fast. He said, uh, should I go straight for the CEH? I, I wouldn't look at the CEH as like a, high level certification in the offensive world or the defense. Agreed. It's, it's kind of like a good baseline. Um, when I, when I went through it, it was like, I learned how to use Nmap and it had some, a lot of, uh, sec plus security plus type information into it. Uh, not a very, it, yeah, it sounds cool. Certified ethical hacker from the outside. But if you go to say a pen testing company, you say, I'm a certified ethical hacker. It's not going to get you very far. It's a it's a lower level cert. OSCP, OSWE, a lot of the SAN certifications. I can't remember the one um, that that I was looking at. It's like spec the Spectre Ops course or something like that. I can't remember what that one was. Um, those types of courses and certifications would be good. I think the only thing I'd add on to that is. Uh... The OSCP is a really hands-on technical certification, but the type of learning um, that that cert cert certification encourages is self-learning. So there are there is some instruction, there's some material to read through, but a lot of times it, you're just in there uh, figuring out yourself, Googling a lot. Um, and that same type of um, learning can be had in free things like uh, Hack the Box, which is a free site out there where you can just go and spin up uh, a VPN connection and start trying to hack into vulnerable uh, virtual machines. So I'd encourage you to look at something like that. Go ahead, Naveen, if you got something to add, and then I, I want something else. Yeah, to I can briefly say. So, I mean, I um, most of my career has been just full full time developer architect type stuff. So, a couple of years ago, um, I put myself through the OSCP as well. So I'd been working on developing defensive security products most of my career. Um, so I wanted to expand my mind a bit. So that, that's where I went through the OSCP exercise. And it's really, really valuable to see the perspective of the attacker. And that's what the OSCP or an exercise like that will force you to do. Um, you know, initially it's hard to kind of come up to terms with all the different tools and techniques out there. But once you kind of pass that initial hump, it's, it's mind opening and it's really valuable. And I think it's really valuable on the defensive side to understand how attackers are hacking you. Um, and going back now, I realize, you know, as a developer, I probably wrote a lot of crappy code back in the day because I never realized the ways my code could be abused. And so that was a really eye opening for me as well. Yeah, that's 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 great, Naveen. That kind of ties to what 
what I was going to bring back. And that is, it's not just about, you know, understanding offensive and, and hacking and all of that. If you break it down, it's finding ways to use a system or service in a way that it wasn't intended. A lot of times from a, in a, in a criminal perspective or an attack perspective, it's how do I break it? How do I get it to tell me something that it wasn't supposed to tell me? And this goes all the way back to the very beginnings of technology and everything is ones and zeros. And it's the more, the, the further time has gone on, the more complex those layers of ones and zeros has become. So the lower in the stack you can understand uh, about how the tech is working, the more you can look at it from a different perspective and the less scary things at the higher layers uh, will be. Meaning, if I understand how multicast works, how might I use that in a different way to get some other information? That's hacking. That's what attackers do. They have specific intent. And you, the more, uh, more components you work with, the more layers in the stack that you understand, like the network layer, you know, the, the session layer, and the, and, and the application layer, the, the better things will make sense and the easier, easier it will be to learn more. So that's my take on that. Look at Tony going all OSI layers on us here. I Old school, baby. <laughs> hey, uh, last question. We've only got a few minutes, but I think it's good. Paul asks the follow-up, is password length and or complexity a deterrent factor for credential attacks? So the password length and complexity, Zach, can you talk just a little bit about hash cracking and uh, the complexity involved and uh, how that's a factor uh, in cracking? Yeah, sure. So in a credential attack, the attacker typically is blind to what the password complexity requirement is in a lot of times. So maybe your domain has a 12 character minimum with one number and one special character requirement. We don't know that going in, but we anticipate that you have at least that requirement. So we'll start off with passwords that meet very basic complexity. So um, as a deterrent, no, it's not really a deterrent because we actually don't know what it is at first. And the first time we're actually able to compromise one of your users, we can then ask the domain with any user account what the complexity is. And then we can then go and refine the type of passwords we're trying to meet that complexity. So um, I'd say it's not really a deterrent at all. I remember that there's been a bunch of reports that 30 characters um, without the complexity is better than 20 characters with the complexity. I can't remember how that was. And that argument has come up several times. What is, what is your take on that? So from a, a password cracking perspective, um, the longer a password is, the harder it is to crack it because that's just the way math works. We have to uh, brute force through so many different combinations. Um, so if the requirement is longer, um, then likely we're not gonna be able to uh, crack any of your passwords. Um, and so it, and because in a lot of times if it's random, it won't be in a password list. So you'll actually have to iterate through every single combination to actually come to some random long password, which is really infeasible. So it won't happen. Just to add to that. So password policy is one thing, but you also have to think about what kind of terms related to your company are out there. So your company name, um, in one case recently, we, we found that we could password spray using the name of products that were released by the company. Um, so all of this is publicly available. And even if your product name is really, you know, good and hard to guess in a normal dictionary, an attacker has got that information on you and can use it to build and generate passwords. That's a really good way to close. I'll tell you, we got one last one and I don't want to let anybody uh, off there, but he asked about the core of our tech uh, and everything. Once again, not a sales pitch, but I can tell you, Credential attacks are just one of the many attack paths that we utilize. 
Uh, we score them a little bit higher so that you get context. And if we do find credentials, uh, we reuse them to further through a uh, and continue on with that path to go on. So uh, to answer your question, uh, it's not a core thing. It's one of the things we use and we find it's pretty darn valuable. And uh, it yeah, it's not just valuable, but lucrative. And it leads us towards a lot of what's valuable and vulnerable across the enterprises we're looking at. So uh, we're just now one minute over. Tony, I'm gonna let you give the last closing remarks before we finish this off. This has been really good. Uh, I want to thank the team. You guys have done a great job of putting this all together and working through this. It was a pretty smooth first one, and, and I know that these things are even going to get better and better and, uh, as, as we go. I want to thank everybody who joined. Um, we appreciate your time, and we hope that this was valuable. Give us whatever feedback you can. Shoot us an email. Uh, here's all, the, all the, uh, the, the stuff for us, and come check out the product. We have a free product for you to take a look at. It's free, free for free. Um, and then... Uh, uh, give us a call if you want any more information on, on uh, how things work. And we look forward to seeing the next one. Thanks, everybody. One last call for everybody. Uh, next month, we are going to be focused on purple teams. And so we'll be doing another webinar on purple teams and accelerating that. That's a big growth area where you can come together between red and blue and not be at each other's throats, but more of a team focused on a singular goal. So we're gonna be doing another webinar next year or next month, and you'll be getting the invite. Uh, if you want, you'll be getting the invite for that. And you'll see it posted out on LinkedIn and all the places that you have down here. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day.